so good to see you guys all here again. Yeah. Who's missing? Oh, Cooper. Obviously. Yeah, obviously. Yeah, the whole room's like out of whack without Cooper. It's like, oh, yeah. Yeah, that's true that, true that. All right, uh, well, it's good to see everybody. Welcome home, as we say, you know, yeah. Anchor House Ohana. All right, let's pray. Father God, thank you for this day, Lord. Just thank you so much, God, to be alive, but most importantly, Lord, to be alive in you, Christ. We're just super grateful that um, the, all, the God, all sovereign God of creation has... Uh, has stooped to make himself known to the likes of us, Lord, and that we get to know you. And thank you that even though we are fully known, we are still fully loved by you, God. We're grateful for this day, grateful for an opportunity to look into your life-giving word and to let our uh, be transformed by the renewing of our minds that we might uh, know your will, we might do your will, God, and in doing so, bring you glory. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen? Amen. Amen. Paige, right? Take a while. And you are Bob, Jim... Philip, is that, is that what you're going by? Philip, and I'm Dane, by the way. I'm George. George? Yes. The philosopher guy? Yeah, yeah. People have been raving about you. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty cool. People are raving about philosophy. You're like, really? Yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. It's super rad. All right, you guys, uh, what book are we in? <laughs> it's, bro, it's, been, it's been what, like three months or something? I'm sure you all remember. You all remember right where we left off, right? Yeah, all right, maybe not. Caleb, right? Caleb, and then there's a Sam, right? I think I got it. And then Paige and Leslie, right? All right. Hear it for the old guy. Yeah, names. Oh, okay. So I want to uh, briefly open this morning. Uh, we will be in Luke chapter 8 today, if you want to turn or uh, scroll to your... Um, to your Luke chapter 8 in your Bible app or whatever you do. Um, I'm just going to briefly tell you a story. When I was uh, 14 years old, uh, I was playing basketball against one-on-one -on -one against my older brother, Brock, who uh, was varsity high school, and I was like junior high peewee. And we were playing one-on-one -on -one in front of our friends, right? My young friends and his high school friends. And I was kicking his butt. <laughs> like, I was having the game of my life. Maybe the best game of basketball I've ever had in my life. And I'm up, we're playing, you know, one-point baskets, and I'm up like eight to two or something, and I've got the ball. Like, I need like two points, and I'm going to beat my, you know, humiliate my brother in front of all my friends and his friends. And I go to drive on him. And you know the little edge of the driveway has that little curb about one inch high? And I like pulled a full Trent. Where's Trent? Yeah. <laughs> I like, I like stuck my foot right into the corner of that little mini curb as I drove and not realizing it broke my foot in half. And uh, it sounds way worse than it was. Just picture of a fracture, Kate. And it's, it wasn't like bones, you know. Okay, yeah, we're good, yeah. So anyways, I'm lying on the ground like, oh, and my brother's got the ball and he's beaning me. Get up, bam, grab the ball, get up. You're just faking it. Get up, I'm going to kick your... So, anyways, that was the end of the game. Next morning, I can't put my foot on. I didn't go to the hospital. I was just like, you know, my dad's like, rub some dirt in it. You know, he's a, he's a doctor, so he knows, right? He knows a lot about feet because my dad was an OBGYN. So he's really good with bones of the foot, right? So the next morning, my, my dad's like, I think he's fine. And my mom's like, Bill. He can't even put his foot on the ground. My dad's like, ah. So she's like, you're going to the hospital. Take him with you to the hospital. That's what you do. You're a doctor. So my dad's like, ah, all right. So why am I telling this story? Because what I want to tell this story for is what happened next, which is really cool. I show up at the emergency room, and my dad, like, you know, I come hobbling in, and my dad's like, this is my son. And all the nurses are like, oh, Dr. Spore, this is your son? Wow. Next thing you know. This wheelchair comes out, right? And I jump in this wheelchair. And they're like, well, just wait right here. My dad's like, can I just leave him with you? And he, like, takes off. And standing next to me at the counter is this really large guy on crutches. And he's, like, doing this. And he's looking at me. And I'm like, hey, how's it? You know? And he's like, yeah. And they're talking to him. And they're talking to him. And they tell him to go sit. And the poor guy can't work on the crutches. Meanwhile, I get my own personalized nurse. 
whatever her name was. Hi, I'm Katie. You just say, uh, I'll be your nurse. And she's like, oh, come with me. Oh, da, da, we just love your dad around here, blah, 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 right, you know? And I go to the x-ray um, room, and the x-ray room's full, right? And she's like, do, do, do. She's like, wait right here. And she goes over to the main reception area and goes, and she's like, bye, Dane. She leaves. First name called Daynard Spore. I'm like, yeah, right here. And whoop, <laughs> right into x-ray. And the guy's like, He's like set my foot up. Hey, your dad's Dr. Spar. Oh, I love your dad. Your dad's great. Right? Wheel back out. And as I go back out into the x-ray room, here comes the big guy in crutches. You know, like that guy's poor guy's like sweat coming out or whatever. And so I go back in the x-ray room, like five minutes later, some guy walks in, yeah, Daynard Spore. Oh yeah, hey, I'm the I'm an orthopedist. Good friend of your dad's. Come with me. Da -da. Wheels me in. In 30 minutes, I'm out with a cast on my leg. And as they wheel me back out to the emergency room, where my mom's now going to have to come pick me up, I see that big guy on the crutches still sitting in the x-ray room. I got a cast up to here. Now, why am I telling you that? Well, it's nice to have your dad being a well-connected physician when you go to the ER, isn't it? Why am I telling you that? Oh, we'll get there. Let's go to the book of Luke. All righty. Okay, so now where we left off was the parable of the four soils, right? A basic teaching, not really difficult to discern, but a couple points to ponder. Remember that the good soil is really the response of a, humble par a humbled heart, the poor in spirit. But remember, I even counted it up the other day. Remember, in that whole section of the, of the four soils, he, sa he uses, um, talks about listening and hearing eight times. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Though hearing, they may not understand. These are the ones that hear. And when they hear it, and for those who hear, and who hear the word, therefore consider carefully how you listen. So, parable of the four soils. We always talk about, oh, does that mean they're saved or not saved? I really think the whole thing's about, are you paying attention to what God is trying to tell you? Okay? So, we are the ones who, like, now that we know the Lord, we have good soil. I hope and trust we're all the good soil people. We scatter seed, and we're going to get all kinds of different responses when we share Christ with our friends, but a lot of it just really comes down to what God's doing in their heart. Our job is to simply spread seed and then trust that between God and those people, they're either going to come to faith if they're humble, if they're listening, if they're poor in spirit, or if they're just going to blow it off. But it's not our responsibility to save anybody. We've been commissioned to be sp seed spreaders. Okay, so today we open with a very brief story before we get to my favorite story that we're going to get to later today. Um, but it's actually a follow-up, if not a conclusion, to the four soils. It kind of appears uh, briefly, but it's actually super connected and because it also has the word here in it, which connects it. Okay, so we're in Luke chapter 8. Join me in verse 19. Let's just read verse 19. Now, Jesus' mother and brothers came to see him, but they were not able to get near him because of the crowd. Okay, so Jesus' family wants to come see him, but he's kind of turned into a celebrity, hasn't he, since the last time they saw him. Imagine a big crowd or whatever, and it says his mother and brothers. Now, did you know that the um, Catholics believe that Mary stayed a virgin her whole life? Is anybody here Catholic? Raise your hand if you're Catholic. No? Nobody's Catholic? Nobody cares? But isn't that, isn't that interesting <laughs> that, that, they, that they assume like, that Mary stayed a virgin? I don't know why they thought that was so important, yeah? But that's not what it says right here in the scripture. Um, uh, MacArthur, where's that? Yeah. Oh, you, oh, no, Cooper. You're the MacArthur guy, right? Yeah. MacArthur calls them half-brothers. That kind of makes sense, doesn't it, right? Okay, because Joseph, their father would have been Joseph, right? Jesus' father would be <laughs> Yahweh. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, Yahweh. Okay, um, but I, um, oh, I also want to read you from the Mark version of this story. This is from Mark chapter 3, verses 20 to 21. Then Jesus entered a house, and again the crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. And when his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he's out of his mind. Okay, so I want you to, like, this is part of the same story. I just read you the Mark version of that. His family shows up, and they say, he's out of his mind. Isn't that interesting? 
Like, we always sort of assume that, like, Jesus' mom and brothers were always completely on board. Now, didn't you think Mary would be more on board because she kind of seemed to know what was going on, right, based on the song that, that's in Mark chapter 3, uh, 20 and 21. Is it not there? Maybe I made it up. I don't know. Maybe it's Mark 13. It might be a typo. Is it there? No, I'm curious now. Is it there? Okay, okay, good. It's there. Because if I had added to the scripture, I'd be in big trouble with God, apparently. Okay, got it, got it. So um, MacArthur speculates that Mary's concern was actually for Jesus' health. Because look what it says there. It says, um, there, there were so many people there that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. Have you ever seen that one scene out of The Chosen where um, the disciples are, are all arguing about who's going to be greatest in the kingdom and Jesus has been out healing all day? And remember that scene? He like comes walking back to his tent and he's so like weary. It looks like he can't even eat. And like some of the gals, Mary Magdalene guys, go to, like, go to take care of him. And like this idea that they're working Jesus to death. He's like healing people, teaching people. Can you imagine? Like everybody wants Jesus, right? Everybody, the crowds, they want to hear what he has to say. They want him to heal the thing they've got. They want him to solve their problem. And his brothers are like, man, they must have lost, he must have lost his senses. What is even going on here? And it's interesting because at first his brothers resist belief in Jesus. Yeah? Um, you know who else resisted their brother? Just thought of this off the top of my head. Joseph. Remember Joseph was sort of like supposed to be the guy anointed by God, and then what did his brothers do? They t sold him off to slavery. Yeah, threw him in a well, and then he got sold off into slavery, yeah? Now, his brothers did come around. In fact, Jesus' brother James uh, became the head of the church in Jerusalem, and he had a nickname called Old Camel Knees because um, he prayed so much he got big knots on his knees. I don't know. That's, that's not in Scripture, Lexi. That's just, yeah. Oh, I don't know. It's some, his, some historical thing. I don't know, right? Okay, now there's a point to all this, so let's keep going. Verse 20. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so someone told him, your mothers and brothers are standing outside wanting to see you. He replied, my mother and brothers are those who hear, oh, there's that word again. If you've been underlining it, you should underline it there because it's part of the soils thing. My mother and brothers are those who hear God's word and put it into practice. So one commentator speculated that this is maybe even a gentle rebuke to Mary or even an indifference to his family, but I don't necessarily know if I think he was rebuking his family. I don't know that he's either um, indifferent to them or hacking them. What I think it might be is a great teaching opportunity right on the heels of this teaching about the four soils, right? Because the whole theme of the four soils was let he who has ears listen, right? Now, people have come to him and said this. Pay attention, this is really good. The people that are closest to you are waiting to see you outside. And what does Jesus say? No, the people that are closest to me are those that hear and believe. You see how it's now connected back to the four soils, right? So, think about what that does. Ooh, I get a little chicken skin moment right here, right? I mean, Jesus got to be pretty close to his mother and brothers, right? Got to be pretty darn close. You're pretty close to your family, right? Look who Jesus says is closest to him. My mother and brother, those that are closest to me are those who hear and understand and believe, yeah? So, to hear followed put into practice is a great challenge followed with a blessing, right? Okay, what do I mean by that? What I mean this, if you hear God's word and you put it into practice, then you become as close to Jesus as his mother and brothers. Maybe even closer, depending on how you weigh out that spirituality, yeah? Um, so if the commandment is um, listen and do what it says, and the reward is um, to come as close as Jesus, can you think of what's the first commandment with a promise? How's that for a Bible trivia? Love that father and mother. Yes, Nick, explain that. And then what? Yeah, exactly. Did you all catch that? The, um, the fifth commandment is honor thy father and mother. The first ones are like, uh, what are the first ones? Uh, Thou shalt have no gods before you, shall not worship any idols, not take the Lord's name in vain. And what am I missing? Oh, keep the Sabbath holy. Keep, bless you. Well, that was brutal. You all right? 
Yeah, keep the Sabbath holy. And then, okay, those are all what do you call horizontal commandments. It's all about you and God, right? Then the first, wait, that's vertical, sorry. <laughs> the first, the vertical commandments, four of them, right? The first horizontal commandment comes with a promise. Honor thy father and mother, and it will go well for you. And you will live long and, you know, what is it? Prosper. What is that? Star Trek. Live long, know, live long and shalom, right? So the blessing is being welcomed into uh, the family of God. And think about the ramifications of that for a second, being in the family of God. In fact, uh, did I have, I had one more concept about that. Oh, yeah. No, well, hang on for a second. Okay, so I want to just park on that idea before we get to the fun story. So John chapter 1, verses 11 to 13. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him, speaking of Israel. Here we go. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. That's the very opening of the book of John, which I know Tony took you through, so I'm sure you understand that all that completely, yeah? But listen to this. Let's, so we got this idea of being born into the family, okay? And then look what um, comes up later on in the book of Luke uh, from chapter 11, verses 27 and 28. As Jesus was saying these things, a woman in the crowd called out, Blessed is the mother who gave you birth and nursed you. Now, by the way, isn't that kind of an interesting thing to shout out? Like, what if Rick was done preaching on a Sunday morning and I'm like, Praise God for your mom! <laughs> right? Isn't that just an odd thing for someone to just shout out? Like, here's Jesus, like he's in the middle of, I don't know what's going on in chapter 11, but he's, just, he's healing or he's teaching or he's doing something. And some random woman yells out, Blessed is the mother who gave you birth and nursed you. Sounds kind of sentimental, like she's almost kind of jealous. Wish I was her mom, right, you know? Why come on, you know, she's looking at her son, Irving, why can't you be more like this Jesus guy, right, you know? How blessed is your mom, right? But look what Jesus says in response to this, like, super random comment. He replied, verse 28, Luke 11, he replied, Blessed rather are those who, are you ready for this? Hear the God, hear, hear, sorry, hear the word of God and obey it. You see, there's that connection again. Listening, obeying, and being connected to Jesus, okay? In fact, uh, another way to transfer it is, um, he says, actually, more than that are those who hear the word of God and obey it. Or that new King James says, on the contrary, blessed are those who hear the word of God and obey it. And then I have one last thing to talk to you about on this little section right here. And I think it maybe came up a little bit at the beginning when we were talking about Mary. But it's a really interesting little factoid about Mary. Remember this. It was necessary for Mary and brothers to somehow disconnect themselves from, bless you, boy, is that thing getting around that quick? Hi, Lauren, good to see you. Hey, how are you? So good to see you, yeah, thanks for sneezing. <laughs> Remember this, it's necessary for Mary, right, and his brothers to receive him as Savior. Now, that sounds like, okay, big deal, but trust me, if my son Cozy suddenly, you know, discovers he's the Messiah uh, right? Uh, the the long-awaited, the return of Jesus, I, right? I'm, that's not like just, oh, okay. No, you're like, well, that's my son. But she has to, like everybody else, repent and receive him as Lord. Did you ever think about that? Yeah? There's no nepotism in the kingdom of God. You guys know what, know what nepotism is? Right, right. Yeah, exactly. It's like when you, you, know, you get the job because your dad's the king or whatever, the dad. Okay, so that's all there is. That's actually sort of, I believe, the, the wrap-up of the four soils about listening, believing, and obeying. Okay, right, right there in that one little bit. Okay, so we're going to move on now to actually one of my favorite teachings. I don't think it's a particularly particularly deep teaching. I just like it as a surfer because it's about waves and it's awesome. Okay, so join me in, ver oh wait, actually, you know, I should stop. Does anybody, because uh, we finished the section, does anybody have a question or a comment on anything about Jesus' mom, his brothers, their faith? 
your life, <laughs> Kate. Oh, about like the soils. Mm -hmm. You're saying that uh, we're the people who are spreading this thing? But I was always trying to figure out which, like. See, most, I, here's what I think. I think, and by the way, yes, it is about the soil of your heart, yeah. But I think most of us read the parable of the four soils, and what we want to really know is, am I in? Am I saved? Am I a good soil person, right, you know? But I'm not necessarily sure that's why Jesus is teaching them the parable of the soil. Perhaps he's ready to send us out into the world, and he's just going to say, look, there's basically four types of responses you're going to get. And um, I know we went over that we, you know, we didn't really teach the parable of the four soils today. We taught that, what, three months ago or whatever, or it feels like it, yeah? But I will tell you, for each one of these people in the parable of the four soils, you know, the hard-packed road, the, the rocky soil, and the thorns, and then I, I have people in mind for every single one of those. Have I, I've seen that played out. In, the, in fact, to get really judgmental on people, you could probably categorize everybody you know into one of those four soils, couldn't you, right? Bueller, Bueller, anybody? I bet I could, yeah. If you wanted to be judgmental about it, you know, and just be like, yeah. And you know what I always say? I always think most of us probably vacillate between really good soil and weeds and thorns. You know, we have moments where we're like producing fruit, and then maybe we have, you know, times where we're in the desert and we're kind of struggling and we're not really doing so well, right? Um, but I don't think the point of that lesson is to talk about, like, the different types of people and salvation as much as, look, you guys are going to go spread seed. And so, you know, pe people that respond have good soil, yeah, and they're humble. And it all goes back to the poor in spirit from the, um, uh, the teaching on the Mount of Beatitudes, all right? Good question, though, Kate. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay, good. Let's move, because let's get to the surf. Okay, verse 22. One day, Jesus said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side of the lake. So they got in the boat, into a boat, and set out. As they sailed, he fell asleep. And a squall came down the lake so that the boat was swamped, and they were in great danger. Okay, so this story occurs in three of the four Gospels. It's not in the book of John, so it's in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, Luke's time reference is out of order um, compared to the other Gospels. But I like the way he says, one day, Jesus said to his disciples. It's almost like Luke was like, yeah, look, we're just going to toss this story in. So one day, and it's disconnected. It's disconnected from the story above it, which is the um, parable of the four sto uh, soils. Um, uh, Mark, uh, Mark suggests that after teaching a whole rack of parables, including the parable of the soils, uh, they went to Capernaum to eat. And maybe that's where um, they ran into uh, Mary and the brothers. And then um, they grabbed the boats, okay? But first I want to give you a little geography lesson about the Sea of Galilee. Um, because quite frankly, as a, guy, as a surfer who lives in Hawaii, I hear about a big storm coming up on the Sea of Galilee. And I'm kind of inclined to go, come on, really? Like, how big could the waves really be on a lake, <laughs> right? Like, no big deal. But, so I did some research on it because I was interested by that. Apparently, I was quite wrong, and here's why. If you've ever, anybody here been to Israel? You guys been to Israel? No? Nobody, nobody's been to Israel. Oh. Well, it's interesting. When, when you go to the Sea of Galilee... Surprised. Yeah, a little bit surprised. I don't know. I guess you're all pretty young, but, you know, Hayden's not young. How come you haven't been to Israel, Hayden? <laughs> yeah, come on. <laughs> come on, man. Step it up, buddy. <laughs> what? <laughs> all right, whatever, whatever, whatever. Okay. So listen up, if you go to the Sea of Galilee, let's say you're looking, let's say you're at the north end and you're looking south. So, so picture with me, if you're standing in Capernaum, which is on the north end of the Sea of Galilee, Galilee, Galilee you're looking south. So just so you know, you got, that's the whole Sea of Galilee, and then on the other side of that is the Dead Sea. You've got Jerusalem's like this way, the Mediterranean's that way, right? But you're in this kind of big scooped, Bull, because you've got the mountains that lead up to Jerusalem and Nazareth over here. And over here you have what they call the Golan Heights. And that's where Syria, well, Syria used to be, but the Israelis kicked them off the Golan Heights. And so they booted Syria back, but now it's all owned by Israel. However, they're like this, this just massive, massive mountain range. And what happens is when you get the right storm conditions, you get a cold weather low that comes across Syria 
and all of a sudden it just comes with this massive, massive drop off down into the Sea of Galilee and that cold wind comes rushing down onto the Sea of Galilee and it makes these insane storms. You ready for this? In 2010, a sudden storm created 30 foot waves. Can I just say that again? 30 foot waves in the Sea of Galilee. And when I went on to like Google it and everything, I saw a YouTube clip of a wave taking out windows on a second story balcony in Tiberias, which is on, it would be on the opposite side. So if the wind comes down this way, it goes across the Sea of Galilee and it slams Tiberias. So my point is, this is a big storm, okay? What's that? And they're in a little boat, right? And um, it says in verse 24a, the disciples went and woke him saying, Master, Master, we're going to drown. Did I read the part that they were swamped and they were in great danger? Did I read that? Okay, okay. So, so the disciples went and woke him saying, Master, Master, we are going to drown. Now, can we just pause there for a second? Um, for good reason, they wake him up. In fact, um, um, the, in the Greek, it means they're, they're terrified, right? When they were, um, oh no, it says in Mark, they were terrified, right? Which uh, we'll come back to that in a little bit. Yeah, they were extremely fearful. I want to point this out to you. These guys are no strangers to storms and boats and being out on a boat, right? So these guys know their stuff. So when they're scared that they're going to die, it's pretty gnarly, right? Super gnarly. But here's a key verse. It's in the book of Mark. And sorry, I didn't write down the chapter. Lexi will find it for us now. Could you find it, please, Lexi? No, I'll, actually, it's probably, oh, it doesn't say right here in my sub notes. Sorry, I didn't write it down. But there's a key line in the book of Mark, and this is what they say to Jesus. Check this out. Don't you care if we drown? Isn't that brutal? Don't you care if we drown, okay? And Jesus calls them afraid, timid, and fearful. But let's pick it up in uh, Luke while Lexi finds the correct verse. Um, so verse 24b, he got up and he rebuked the wind and the raging waters and the storm subsided and all was calm. Okay, this is my favorite part right here. Jesus rebukes the storm. I love that. But as a surfer, there's a key point in this story that fascinates me and I want it to fascinate you today as well. And just so you know, I went and I read all the Greek from all three versions in the Gospels to make sure I got it right before I taught this point. Um, in the book of Matthew, they say, even the waves obey him, okay? Why is this such a big deal to me? And here's why. What creates waves? Wind. Wind, exactly. So we had a big swell here last week. Uh, that swell actually got started south of the Aleutian Islands, which is why it wasn't a particularly good one, because the best ones start up in the Aleutian Islands. You know where that is? Who's from Alaska? Raise your hand. You guys know where the Aleutian Islands are, right? Yeah, you absolutely do, right? Yeah, you know where the Aleutian Islands are, right? So basically, if you blow across the top of a glass of water, it makes ripples, right? Right? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Lexi for paying attention. Everybody else just, let's, I'll talk to Lexi here, yeah. You blow across, right? Now, if you do that, like, across a vast expanse of water, but with, like, a huge, huge storm, it creates, like, these big, 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 big giant waves. And then they collect themselves as they head south. They get in a nice big long lines, and you get waves. But here's the catch, and here's why I'm so fascinated by this verse. If the wind stops, like, just in a normal situation without Jesus rebuking it, right? The wind just stops. Do the waves just go, or do the waves continue to slosh? They continue to slosh. And one of the reasons I know this is, is for example, if we have a really terrible wind for surfing here on the island, what we call an onshore breeze, and it blows for days and it makes the wind all messed up, well, the first day that the wind stops, the surf's still terrible because it takes about a full day. Like, you know, like if you're, you know, in the bathtub and you swirl the water around and how it has to slowly, right, over time. Well, quite frankly, I know this as a surfer, when the wind stops, it takes almost an entire 24 hours for the ocean to calm down. This is what I think really freaked out the apostles. Not only did the wind stop, but they said, even the waves 
obeyed him. So, I don't know if it was 30-foot waves, but even if it was 15-foot waves, and you're a sailor, and you've been a fisherman your whole life, and all of a sudden, he says, enough! <laughs> then they're terrified of him. Yeah, terrified. Let's pick up the story. Where is your faith, he asked his disciples, and I love this, in fear and amazement, they asked one another, who is this? He commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. So first of all, Jesus says, where's your faith? Now that's interesting, because what have they seen Jesus do up to this point? Anybody? He's healed people, cast out demons. Yeah, he brought the widow's son back from death. And yet, they're blowing their minds on this one. Like, like, it's almost like in spite of all of that, they still weren't ready for his complete mastery of the creation, his complete control of the physical reality that we live in, where he can just go lie down and a 30-foot wave just goes, okay, right? And I love their reaction. They were kind of scared before, now they're actually terrified. Now, why do you think they might have been terrified? He has power. <laughs> That's some serious power. That's what I think. Remember, you know, um, we've all been to magic shows and whatever, right? <laughs> you know. But I think I've shared this with you before. But what if, like, I was able to just completely alter reality right now in front of your face? Like, most of you wouldn't be like, oh, yeah, you should go to Vegas, Dane. You'd blow your minds. You'd be terrified, right? Night, right now. What's that? I said, if you made it yeah, if I could just, like, yeah, snap my fingers and it became night and the moon popped out and I snapped my fingers, it became day. Your, your response wouldn't be like, hey, that's pretty cool. <laughs> We'd be freaking out, right? Like, yeah, yeah, we, yeah, exactly. That was a good, that was a good example, Lexi, yeah? Um, okay, so something that's different here. Now, if you remember, if you go back from before the, um, uh, when we go back to uh, the, the sinful woman who anointed um, Jesus' feet, which was right after uh, Jesus raises the widows from the dead. And remember that, um, when he raises the widow's son from the dead, there was all this Elisha imagery, right? And it was all about proving um, the, the high prophet status of Jesus. So let's kind of think about that. And here's what's interesting, because prophets did some amazing miracles over natural elements. But remember, they always did it by calling upon the power of God. Jesus doesn't ask God to do a miracle. Jesus just speaks it, right? And that is what's freaking them out right now, because what is this guy capable of, right? So, in another story from the book of Matthew, Jesus walks on the water during a storm that, again, threatens to drown them. Seems like they would have learned the first time, but whatever. And look what it says in Matthew chapter 14, uh, verse 33. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. So they're sort of dancing around the ultimate issue of him being God's Son and what that even means. But this is just one of those little things where Jesus blows their mind. And by the way, I love the fact that he was sleeping through all of that. Okay, a couple of things about that. It's not just that, oh, wow, well, of course, because he's God and he's in full control. But I think he was super tired, like super, super tired. The guy was asleep. But somehow they wake him up. And he's like, what? And I think when he says, you know, when he says, where's your faith? It's not because they woke him up and said, could you deal with the problem? Because they were terrified. And by the way, if I could just kind of riff on that, I've got a couple applications I want to get to in a second. If I could just riff on that for a second. I love this idea of being safe with Jesus, right? One time, um, uh, I was on a Sunday morning, and I, uh, spend, I spent time with Jesus in the front row of the church there. And I, was, um, I, I call it my hangout with Jesus time. I just sort of like have coffee and talk to him and stuff. And, and it dawned on me like how... If, okay, let's just like pull a chosen moment here. If Jesus like walked into the room right now, and I mean really, like Jesus, right, you know, like shows up in the room, and he's like, come on, let's go do something, right? Like, like think about the safety and security you can have right now in that moment, right? 
Like, nothing can happen that is outside of the will of God, even if something bad happens, which is technically the way we are supposed to feel all the time, right? But we get distracted and we forget that God's in total, yeah, I heard a lecture on that this morning, actually. We forget that God is in total control, so we have fear, right? But if I, like, am sitting with Jesus Christ himself and I could say, hey, could you quickly check me for cancer, Lord, <laughs> right? And he could be like, just put my, his hand on me and go, you're, you're good, <laughs> right? Or I could say, um, oh, no, somebody's coming in to rob me at gunpoint right? How afraid would you be if you were just sitting there with Jesus next to you? It's kind of laughable to think about. Do you get my point? Like, those are kind of lousy illustrations. But have you ever thought how perfectly at peace and content you can be in the presence of Jesus Christ, right? Okay, so I, I know that like the classic daily bread application of this story is what? in the storms of life, right? And we all know that, right? Oh yeah, the storms of life. So you had a bad day, you get a bad phone call, there's an issue with in a relationship, whether it's your boyfriend, girlfriend, parents, brother, whatever, this and that. The storms of life, right? Be rooted in Christ. I, what I'm trying to do is make a connection between the disciples freaking out, Jesus saying, don't be scared, you're with me, and you in your life because you know Jesus. And that he is accessible to you right now is he was that day in the boat, which takes us back to me telling you a story about getting my foot broken and going to go see the doctor, or excuse me, going to the emergency room when my dad is the much loved doctor, right? In other words, Think of the benefits of being born into a family that has connections, right? Um, I wrote down some things here. You guys probably don't know who Shane Dorian is, but his, his kid is like an up-and-coming surfer, and his dad's a super famous ex-surfer, and so he's been given everything, and the guy's probably going to be a future world title. Everything's sort of been handed to him. But um, that's a lousy one. Do you guys know who LeBron James is? Anybody? Bueller, yeah. Yeah, so his, his son is about ready to go pro right now. Well, how nice to have your dad be virtually the best basketball player alive right now. Yeah, some of you would like me to debate me on that, but whatever, yeah, bear with me, right? And you're coming through the ranks, super connected, right? Super connected at every level. Or if you wanted to go into acting and your dad's Dom, Tom Hanks, right? Pretty good connect right there, right? Well, here's the thing. When we declare Jesus our Lord... Our Father becomes God, Yahweh. Um, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5. Um, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ. <laughs> and for some reason, I wrote that down in my notes. You guys ever see that Liam Neeson movie, Taken? As, really? I thought you guys were Christians. I'm just kidding. I set you up, yeah. But remember what he says? I have a specific set of skills, <laughs> right? And now you've messed with my daughter, right? And you're supposed to be like, whoa, right? Well, our father has a specific skill set, right? First of all, it's kind of everything, right? He's in charge of everything. He controls everything. He holds everything in his hands. He's aware of everything. He's perfectly powerful of everything, right? But I would say this too. Our God possesses a specific set of skills on how to love people, yeah? And that is available to us. So, my next application is this, the awesome and incredible power of Christ. If Jesus Christ created all that is made, especially making something out of nothing, which I hope you all understand is the greatest creation moment of all. It's not that he took what was there and he shifted it. He spoke everything out of nothing, right? Think how easy a little magic trick is like him calming a storm, right? Um, one of my favorite sermons I ever heard of all time was when a guy was telling a story about how he was praying and he was asking God to do something for him. And then he began to question if, you know, like even God could handle it. And then he said, and then I remembered that God made Saturn. <laughs> and I think God can handle my little problem that I have, yeah? And then lastly, the most obvious teaching. Oh, good timing with that. Three minutes left to go. 
uh, the most, you know, kind of daily bread type teaching out of the day is trusting Jesus through the storms of life. And it's easier said than done. And, um, you know, easy for me to say, so to speak, right? And yet, ultimately, that is a great story uh, for today. And that real level of trust, I put in one last um, applicational story uh, that spoke volumes to me because um, I was having coffee with a snowbird, one of the people that are here. You saw the snowbirds on, uh, Trish, you saw the snowbirds on Tuesday night, my Bible study. Yeah, like, they're like, a flock of them are here now, right? They're huge, right? And this one guy asked me out for coffee, and he was really um, bummed out and, um, because uh, his wife had got sick with cancer, and all these people came to him saying, oh, it's God, God's going to do it. God's going to heal her. God's going to heal her. And then, and then she died. And he's like, now I feel like I can't trust God. And I'm like, no, now is when you can trust God the most in this storm in your life because God doesn't promise any of us that everything will go well for us and that's why we trust him. He says, trust me in everything because think about it. Every single guy that was in the boat with Jesus, they're all dead, right? They all got sick of something. (laughs) They all continued to have rough lives. Things didn't go perfectly, right? And so I'll never forget one time uh, when I was a brand new believer and uh, somebody in the church got cancer. Uh, We weren't here yet. We were up in a little office building up in Rainbow Plaza. And I was a brand new believer. I didn't know anything, right? But they're like, hey, after church today, we're going to have a prayer rally to pray for this gal's cancer that she'll be healed. Okay, so I was a brand new kid. I didn't know anything. They circled the chairs. About 100 people in this circle, right? And everybody's praying, oh, you know, in the name of Jesus, we proclaim, you know, we dominion over this cancer, cast out, you know, blah, 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 everything like that. And you guys know who Tom Finley is? You don't know? I know you know. He's one of the founding elders. Uh, He's the guy that runs the camera at my Bible study. Anyways, you see him around. You'd recognize him. He's around. And I'll never forget what he prayed. This is what he said. He goes, well, Lord... We don't actually know if it's your will to heal this woman, or maybe it's your will to give her the ultimate healing and take her home to be with you. We don't know that. Okay, now you probably can guess how the rest of the prayer went, right? But boy, at that moment, I was like, oh, blasphemy. I can't believe he just said that. Like, you're not supposed to talk like that. You're not, because I didn't know anything, right? I didn't know anything, right? And that kind of blew my mind. But I went and talked to him about it later, and it blew my mind. Like, imagine, now that's real trust. Whatever you decide, God, I'm with you. I put my, my chips in with you. I hear and I believe and I trust you. In my storms of life, no matter the outcome, I trust you. Okay? So Jesus cares. Now remember in the book of Mark, um, the disciples say to him, don't you care if we drown? Right? not recognizing that Jesus is in the very midst of saving all of them for eternity, right? Because they're all going to physically die in the next, what, 20 to 30 years, 40 years max, probably, right? Don't you care if we drown? You see the irony of their statement? Don't you care if we die? And Jesus is like, you you don't even know. I'm here so that you will never die. I got this, yeah? Isn't that awesome? Yeah, I just love that. Doesn't mean Jesus doesn't care. He's in the process of quite literally loving them into eternal life, right? Okay, so we wrap up with these questions. Who do you say that I am? What is he capable of? And does he care? Okay, questions, comments? Did I just speak you all into like flattened you out into like oblivion? Everyone's just like, no more, no more, no, no mas. Yeah, no questions, no comments. It's all just. All right, well, let's pray then. Father God, thank you so much, Lord. Um, Lord, we trust you, God. Um, And Lord, I I thank you that when I don't trust you, you're still faithful, God, because you're super aware of my heart, Lord. Um, Even when I don't trust you, Lord, I'm just never going to stop seeking you, Lord. Father, you hold us and our lives, Lord, in the palm of your hands. You've given us this this physical life here on earth to, to... to move around in your create in your creation, God, but you have also brought us alive spiritually, Lord. You have we have been born again because of your great care and concern for us, God. 
And so, Father, I, I, my prayer, Lord, is that we'll learn a little bit from this message this morning, myself included, Lord, that our hearts would just be turned that much more towards you, that our level of confidence in how we walk around on this planet, Lord, would, would grow just even a small bit, Lord, that the, um, our brains, our, the, our minds would be transformed just even a little bit more, that we might leave this place again, Lord, more confident in you and your love in us, that we don't need to be afraid of anything or anybody because our Father is the King of heaven, Lord, and his Son, Lord, you, Jesus, um, Say, don't be scared. Trust me. Don't be afraid. Where is your faith? May we be faithful believers, God, fearless before you. In your son's name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.